Amen? But when we're talking about you are an amazing God that does something to the inner man, even though chaos is going on around me, Brother Patrick, he's still amazing. And I stand awestruck at the power, hallelujah, that he places in us. And so I'm going to sing a little bit of this song, and I'm going to say my Easter speech, my four points, and I'm going to get out the way. And I'm just going to say this. I, I went back and I listened to Brother Trayvon. See it. Do it. Receive it. And then while I was on the boat, I heard Brother Patrick talk about focus focus and so we can't talk about focus just focus because it's necessary to talk about the other side of that some distractions to your focus <laughs> Woo. and so brother Patrick I heard you say that brother Trayvon was in your message well you was in my message praise the Lord but that just shows the consistency of the house the vision of the house, that everybody falls in line. Even when we're in different places, the Holy Spirit can bring us together. I think in the corporate world, Sister Rowe, they call that synergy. Okay, okay. <laughs> Amen. So I'm going to sing just a little bit of this song because I need to get focused on what God has given me to give you today. Amen. And it just, y'all pray for me. I don't know what key, key I'm starting in. I am troubled, but not distressed. Perplexed, but not in despair. For I'm a vessel full of power with a treasure none can compare. Persecuted but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. For I am a vessel full of, full of power with a treasure from the Lord. Holy Ghost power. I've got a treasure in this old broken vessel from the Lord. So I say, thank you, Father, for your power. It has resurrected circumstances that my poor heart Jesus could not flee hallelujah come on and give God some glory that even when we're broken when we're bruised when we're persecuted when we're cast down he has not changed his mind about you hallelujah 
Hallelujah. Through my missteps and my mistakes, my iniquities, my sin, he has not changed his mind about me. He has not changed his mind about you. And I thank God that even though I got some cracks, I got some scars, I got some breaks, I got some tears, that he still chooses. Still chooses to use me. And I just thank God. I thank God for pastors that's after his own heart, that are not haughty and lifted up and, and prideful. Hallelujah. You just don't know what we have here in this little bitty storefront. We have more power in this house than all the mega churches that you pass by on the way here. Because we have pastors that seek the heart of God, that care about our souls, that don't mind correcting you when you're wrong because they care more about your soul than you being happy with them. And I thank God for that. See, that's old school when those mothers used to come and, and, t and sit down, baby. But see, people get offended now. How dare he? I've got a gift and I'm gifted and I'm anointed. If you a self-proclaimed anointing, I'm, I don't want you to check your anointing. Because everybody in the Bible that was anointed, <laughs> that was a heavy mantle. But you now have pop-ups. They popping up like popcorn. I'm anointed. I'm a prophetess. I, and ain't nothing you said came true. Not even when you told me you was going to pick me up at 10 o'clock. My father-in-law used to say, you lying prophet. You said you was going to do that and uh, some came up. Come on. It's time for us to get focused on what God is calling us to do. And in order to be focused, hallelujah, if focus is defined as the act of concentrating interest or activity on something. And he said, don't look to the left or to the right, but stay focused on the vision. Stay focused on the goal. So today, in keeping with the theme of focus, I think it's necessary to talk about some things that will cause us to lose focus so that we are not ignorant. That's the Bible word. I ain't calling y'all ignorant. I know y'all got PhDs and MBAs and all of that. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. But he said, I don't want you to be ignorant of the schemes or the wiles of the devil. And sometimes because we are, uh, our focus is divided, the devil can come in and sideswipe us. And so he said, today, I want you to talk about some of those things that cause us to lose our focus. Distractions. Who distractions. That is defined as a diversion or something that prevents giving full attention to something. And so in keeping with the line and keeping with the vision of the house and not to get in trouble, call to the principal's office. I'm going to stay right there. Amen. Amen. So when we talk about distractions, we see in the Bible many times that great men and women of God lost their focus and the vision and the purpose that God called him to because of extenuating circumstances. Many times when they lost focus, it was detrimental to their mission. They had to go back. Revelations, he said, do your first works over. Go back and do it over. And sometimes it was catastrophic to lose focus. We see Adam and Eve being distracted, distracted and deceived in the garden and lost their connection with God. We see Cain distracted uh, because his offer, offering was not accepted. And instead of going back and correcting that thing, he committed murder. We see Abraham even losing focus on the promise and the vision that God gave to him and said, come on, Lot, you go with me too. But God didn't tell him to take Lot. And so later on, there was dissension between the camps. Y'all know the Bible. I'm just, I'm just throwing some little introduction out here. Hallelujah. Samson 
losing focus and laid his head in the wrong woman's lap. And we know how that turned out. Hallelujah. Don't, don't, don't get caught with your head in the wrong woman's lap. Amen. David, not focusing on his mission and where he needed to be, found himself on a roof, distracted by the beauty of Bathsheba. And then after that, hallelujah, one bad decision after another. Distraction is one of the enemy's greatest tools, and he knows how to use it. Ooh, he knows how to use it. He wants to derail us from pursuing, pursuing our God-given mission in life. More than any other attack, this is what he uses. Check it, check it. It's the most effective, and it's a formidable weapon because we are, our focus is divided, and we don't see him coming, Okay. The Bible says watch and watch and pray. Amen. So how can you stay focused when distraction come your way? So we're going to talk about it. We're going to go to the scripture, uh, 1 Samuel 30. We're going to look at um, David. And we're going to talk about staying focused in the midst of distractions. And we're going to use his story in 1 Samuel 30, 1 through 10. And if you'll stand... I love it. Bree read the scriptures today, and um, I think Jeffrey has this up here. We can read it together. There's something about reading the word of God out loud. Faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and sometimes we just want to read silently. But God said, let's read it together on today. So let's start. Ready? Read. Three days later, when David arrived home at their town of Ziklag, they found that the Amalekites had made a raid into Negev and Ziklag. They had crushed it and burned it to the ground. Number two, they had carried off the women and children and everyone else, but without killing anyone. When David and his men saw the ruins and realized what had happened to their families, they wept until they could weep no more. Jesus. David's two wives, Nehom from Jezreel and Abigail, the wither of Nabal from Carmel, were among those captured. David was now in great danger because all his men were very bitter about losing their sons and daughters, and they began to talk of stoning him. But David found strength in the Lord his God. Then he said to Abathar, the priest, bring me the ephod. So Abathar brought it. Then David asked the Lord, should I chase after this band of raiders? Will I catch them? And the Lord told him, yes, go after them. You will surely recover everything that was taken from you. So David and his 600 men set out. And they came to the brook Besor. But 200 of the men were too exhausted to cross the brook. So David continued. Amen. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing to the hearers and the readers of his word. God, we just ask right now that as we expound on this scripture, God, with what you've given me, God, that you would take the forefront, God, in this message, God. I ask that the ears be open, the minds be alert, God, to hear the word so that we can practically apply it to our lives in this season of focus, God. God, help us to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. God, help us not to be ignorant of his schemes, God. We thank you for your blessing. We thank you for your grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So looking at the topic, staying focused in the midst of distractions. I want to approach this topic and the story of David, number one, with three key components. We're going to have three key components. We're going to look at four distractions. That's all I could narrow it down to. Okay, that cause us to lose our focus. Number one, in able to stay focused, you have to be authentic. You have to operate in truth of where you are in your life, in your walk, in whatever you're doing in, in order to stay focused. If you're not real, say keep it real. 
Okay? If you're not real with yourself, the devil can use that and bring distractions so that you are not focused on the goal. Amen? It is important that we approach distractions with truth. Call it what it is. It is what it is. Amen? Amen. We have to identify where we really are. In order to deal with it, you got to be real with it. I don't know, that sounds like a t-shirt. In order to deal with it, you got to be real with it. It's time out for us putting on a mask, Brother Cedric, and showing up and faking and shaking. I never liked the topic, fake it till you make it. No, make it so you don't have to fake it. Amen? Because when we start faking, we are not being honest with God, and God already know. So who who you trying to fool for real? So being authentic. Number two, uh, Pastor Stacy hit on this. You got to be intentional about your focus. It's so much stuff going on in the world. You turn on the TV, boom, bad news. You look at your Facebook page, oh, RIP. It is so easy for you to lose your focus, so you have to be intentional. You got to make a targeted effort to defeat the distraction. After you identify it, now you need to be intentional with it. Don't play with it like my grandma say. Don't play with it. Don't play with it. Right, mama? Listen, the devil is not playing with you. Why are you out here playing patty cake, patty cake, baker's man? He trying to take you out. Why are you trying to pity pat and, and look cute? Baby, you better get on your face and tarry before the Lord and ask for some discernment on how to deal with your distraction. Amen? Amen. Once you identify, then you can overcome it because now you have a target. You have a target. You're not just shooting arrows hoping to hit something. You have a target. You got to be intentional. The, thir- the third key is to be strategic. Now, strategy, strategic, don't that put you in the mind of a war? Well, you in a war, you fighting every day. Like Craig, you're going to live to fight another day. Amen? Come on, right? You have to be strategic about this thing. You have to have a strategy. Why? Because your enemy got one. He got a strategy. Now, his strategy ain't really changed much. He just kind of fluffed it up a little bit, you know, uh, to some of the distractions that we call now multitasking. (laughs) It's a myth. It is a lie. And it's causing people's heart to fail them because they're trying to be concentrated on two different things. There's a little part of your brain. I used to teach high school science in your brain right here in the middle of your forehead. Smallest part of your brain. It's called the, the prefrontal cortex. That is where you do all your critical thinking. Okay? Smallest part. But if you, that's why when you're lost and the kids are in the back screaming and hollering, and you be like, be quiet, you turn the radio down because now you got to focus all of your efforts on your PFC so you can figure out where you are. It's true. Y'all look it up. And just, a, just another clue in here your brain has not had an upgrade since Adam. Just saying. It's the same brain, fight or flight, which one you going to do? But we we, we put all this stuff in it, okay? So the enemy wants to distract us, okay? Um, So those are our three keys. Be authentic, be intentional, and strategic. Y'all got it? All right, let's go on. Now, we know that God calls all of us toward a greater purpose for our lives. Now, our part, he's done his part before I formed you in your mother's womb. He did that already, okay? So our part now is that we must identify our purpose, and God ain't playing hide and seek with your purpose. It's over here. All you got to do is ask him. And here's the thing. He's giving you clues already. Those things that are in you already that you find, that's my flow. That's a part of your gifting. That's a part of your purpose. He created you that so that you can, you know, touch the world. It's not just for you and your foe and no more. Okay? So we have a purpose. Our part is to maintain focus, keep moving forward, and so we can reach it. Amen? So I want you to think about as we go through this message, I promise you it's short, 33 minutes. What purpose is God calling you toward? Do you know? Okay. 
right? What is he calling you to? What are you focused on achieving in this season? And then I want you to think about what is distracting you, right? All right. Four distractions whew, that I had to deal with just this week. So I'm like Pastor Patrick. I'm preaching to myself first. <laughs> I done preach it to me and Argo the cat. He's, he's very focused right now at home. Uh, <laughs> Four distractions that can take away your focus. And then we're going to talk about how to get it back. And we're going to um, we're gonna parallel this with the life of David at Ziklag. And I'm going to show you how he was authentic, he was intentional, and then he asked for a strategy. All right? The first one, guilt or grief and regret is a distraction. It is no doubt that David was overwhelmed when he got back to Ziklag, he had just got through conquering, you know, somebody, you know, he was, a, he was a warrior. But when he got back, he probably regretted, oh, I shouldn't have left the camp unprotected. <sighs> Guilt, because he was the leader. And a lot of times your leaders, if you're a leader, there's a lot of times that you feel guilt when something doesn't go right with the team. And you take that on yourself. Distraction. Amen. Amen. Verse 4, it tells us David wept right along with the others. So he felt everything that all of his 600 men felt. He had lost his wife, his kids, his stuff. And the Bible says all of them was crying so much that they didn't even have strength. Have you ever been there? Well, you're like, I ain't got, I got no more tears. I'm all cried out. Amen. He wept, wept right along with the others. So he even said in Psalms 38 and 4, he said, my guilt has overwhelmed me like a heavy load. It is more than I can bear. And I don't know about you, but I've been there. When it was so overwhelming that I, I, I it was just in this, this place of despair. And I was like, God, it was more than I could bear. And he went on in Psalm 38 and 4, and he said, now before I got real authentic, with my sins and with my missteps. I kept it all inside. A lot of us do that. You know, you put on the mask. Somebody asks you, how you doing? Oh, I'm okay. I'm okay. All right, Shaniqua. I'm good. <clears throat> right? And he said, I kept it all inside, and my dishonesty devastated my inner life because I wasn't being real with myself. Listen, I'm upset too. It is okay for you to have those emotions. Jesus had them. He said, you can be angry and sin not. I don't know about you, but when Jesus was rolling through the temple, I didn't see him going, excuse me, y'all shouldn't be doing this. Excuse me. No, the Bible said he was turning over tables. That's the kind of Jesus. I was like, yes. <laughs> Jesus, boy, he turned over tables. Amen. He said, it devastated my inner life. Then it will cause you to be filled with frustration because ain't nothing going right. You just wake up at 7 a.m. mad. You mad at breakfast? Like, what is going on? Right? Uncontrollable anguish. It just comes up on you out of nowhere. It's just like you can't control the anguish and misery. He said in verse 4 of Psalm 38, he said, The pain never let up, for your hand of conviction was heavy on my heart. He said, my strength was sapped. I don't feel like getting out of bed today. I don't feel like doing nothing. Don't nobody say nothing to me. To th don't ask for nothing. <laughs> don't say nothing. Don't look at me. I was sapped. And he said, my inner life, and that's the most important one, the inner life, your inner self, dried up like a spiritual drought. Amen. And then he came back and he said, listen, when we don't talk about and deal with the things that is causing us the grief, the guilt, the regret, we become overwhelmed and frustrated, and that's just where the enemy wants us. Uh, we become more easily fatigued. We wiped out little small tasks, circumstances. Oh, it could be just something small. But because we're in that place of drought, it feels like, you know, everything has just broken loose in our lives. We get distracted 
either because we focus too much on the guilt, stay in that. Grandma said, don't wallow in it. Get up. Don't wallow. Didn't know what that meant, but I guess I do now. Right? So we focus too much on, on, on the thing, and we try to do, or we try to do everything to avoid it. Either way, your focus is misplaced. Your focus is in the wrong place. It is off. Now let's take a look at how David dealt with this distracting distraction to get his focus back. In Psalm 32 and 5, he said, then I just let it all out. He said, being honest with God, God gave me a clean slate and suddenly the pressure was gone. When you start to identify this distraction, when you start to identify it and attack it, and then you give it to God, he says, suddenly the pressure was gone. The guilt was dissolved, and my sin disappeared because now I can get intentional about this thing. Amen? Being honest with God and people. Everybody say, and people. Love God with all your heart and love people. So he said, once you get honest with people, and some of us have been hurt by people, and we shun talking to people because I don't trust nobody. I don't trust nobody. But that's when you can get close to God and say, God, who's in my circle? Because everybody that's, you know, in your corner ain't in your circle. We saw that with Jesus, amen, when, when Judas betrayed him, right? So you got to get intentional and say, God, who? And he'll, he'll give it to you. Now, and he'll also tell you who, not, who is not. And you better be ready for that answer. <laughs> Because sometimes it can hurt your heart because there's levels to this, Pastor D, right? We got somebody on a level, and they ain't supposed to be on that level, and it hurts our heart when God said, uh-uh, not her, not him. But, God, we've been knowing each other for, that's my roomie, that's my homie. Some of this stuff, Pastor Trayvon said, you've got to cut it out. <laughs> Amen? God is not just saying be honest with your guilt because he wants you to feel bad but because he knows it's distracting you from your purpose. So what can you be honest about today to stop being distracted by filling the blank? Pray about it and ask God to give me two people, two two or three people, right? I heard Pastor Patrick say when Jesus went up to pray, everybody went with him, but he only took three with him. And I heard you say, I don't know why you chose those three. I don't know. But, amen. Three. You only need three. Y'all ain't got all these new friends, right? No new friends, right? Ah, Jesus, okay? And be honest. Number two, unchecked emotions can be a distraction. Unchecked emotions. David, again, here is operating in honesty in his emotions. He's upset. He's distressed. He's crying. His anguish is multiplied. And now, on top of that, the same folks that was with him fighting done turned against him and wanting to stone him. How much can one person take? Oh, just on top, on top, on top. Now, they talking about stoning him. They're so upset. Hey, this could have easily kept David distracted. But look at what he says in Psalm 6 and 7. I'm, not, I'm just paraphrasing these, so y'all go read them. He said, my eyes of faith won't even focus anymore. And you know, people say, just pray about it. And you'd be like, I can't even pray. I need something else. I, I can't even pray. He said, my eyes of faith won't focus anymore, for sorrow fills my heart. And there are so many enemies that's coming against me. Unchecked emotions. There's two ways that we can be distracted. First, we may let our emotions take over. We get tossed back and forth because we ride the waves of each emotion that comes, and there's no way to focus on anything because, again, my emotions are all over the place. They're out of control undisciplined. That's when I need to be intentional about capturing that and, and, and holding it captive. Paul said, I command my spirit. So you can command your spirit to sit down and, and sit down somewhere. You can do that. You have the power within you to say, hey, I'm not fixing to be wishy-washy, right? We can be 
distracted by unchecked emotions when we stay closed up. We're unwilling to be open and vulnerable about how we really feel. We end up thinking, living small, because our main focus now is just keep everything in. Okay, we put this wall up. We don't let people in. Amen? And so that's an unchecked emotion. What is your response to dealing with emotions? Regardless of your response, both distract us from becoming who we were meant to be in God. So David at this point was like, all right, he didn't wallow in his emotions, but then he became intentional in his response. Number one, he got away from them. Sometimes you have to get away from the people who are going through the same thing you are. Misery loves company. If we both in the same pit, who going to help us out? Amen. David, even David's family, when David was running from Saul, you know, he went to the land of his enemies. He went to King Achish, and that's how he ended up in Ziklag. Ziklag is in the land of Gath, and y'all remember who was from Gath? Goliath. That was his hometown. So he had to even watch his back, even his atmosphere, right? And so he had to get away. So when David's family heard, oh, he down there in the cave, right? Because when he went to the king, he, the, he heard the people saying, this is David. Wait a minute. That's David at the gate. He the one that killed 10,000, and he heard it, and he said, Brother said, he said, oh, if they know it's me, they're going to kill me. So he began to act crazy. <laughs> he started getting spit out of his mouth, foaming at the mouth, and, and then the king said, why y'all bring this crazy man to, to my gate? Don't we have enough crazy people in here? <laughs> right? <laughs> and so David then escapes to the cave, and then his family comes to him. This is in 21 of uh, first, uh Samuel verse uh, chapter 21, and he said that everybody that came to him had something in common. They were all distressed, in debt, disillusioned. So these men that gathered themselves to him, and the Bible says and David became the leader <laughs> of them. They were all distressed, broke down, you know, came to him, and now he's the leader. So these men who are talking about stoning him had that propensity to go back to familiar to what they weren't worth. Because they haven't been delivered, right? So that's why they started talking about, we're going to stone him. It's your fault. If you didn't have us out, blah, 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 right? You, you encounter people like that. Everything is your fault, right? No ownership. So he got away from them. Sometimes God will tell you to isolate. Jesus had a mission. Jesus said, y'all wait right here and just Watch with me. Can y'all just watch? Because the people that just came and, you know, they've just been betrayed. Can y'all watch and make sure don't nobody run up on me? Can y'all have my back? Hey, sometimes you got to get away from folks. Then he remembered who God was, getting his unchecked emotions, checking his emotions, right? Remember who God was and who he was. He was like, wait a minute. How soon we forget when we get in a crisis what God did the last time we was in a crisis? You know, we got this selective memory, Pastor Trayvon. Didn't God just bring me out of, okay? But now that we're in it and we can't see our focus is divided, we're trying to survive. David said, let me go talk to my father. There's a verse in Psalm 42 and 5, and this was the sons of Korah who was actually saying this, but I believe David said, why? Am I so upset? Why am I so overwrought? Why am I disturbed? Why can't I just hope in my God? Let me go talk to the source. I heard <laughs> Pastor Patrick say, if you need some instructions, go to the instructor. If any man lacks wisdom, let him go to who? The Father, right? And so he said, why am I, you know, despite my emotions, I'm going to believe and praise the one who saved me. So he acknowledged his emotions. He got them in check, right? What emotions do we need to take to God so that we can regain our focus on the vision and move forward? Because here's the thing. Emotions will have you stuck. You, still, you hear a song on the radio, and you remember your girlfriend back in 1978 that left you for Billy Bob, and you get right back into the same, and you start feeling the same way. Let me check my emotions. 
And here's the thing, some of us like to be there. So we, we intentionally try to go back there. But God can't because you're stuck. You can't move forward. Amen? Amen. So what if emotions do we need to take to God so we can regain focus and move forward? Amen? That was number two. See, I told y'all. Number three, fear and anxiety. This is when on those two, two and three, you got to get real intentional. Those unchecked emotions, you got to check them. Who going to check me, boo? Right? <laughs> and then the fear and anxiety will overtake you. Fear and anxiety. Still looking at David in this situation, you know, when he came to the camp, I'm sure he was, you know, the, coming off of victory and he was just waiting for people to be, you know, the parade was out and it was burnt to the ground. Fear. What had happened was, what has happened here, right? And then anxiety about the unknown. Who did this? Where they at? Right? And so he had to overcome fear and anxiety. Sometimes, like I said, we need to get from around people who are going through the same thing we are and surround ourselves with people who are going to encourage us. Um, Kinsley and I went on a little four-day cruise and she was determined, Gigi, I'm going to swim with the dolphins. Now, Gigi wasn't getting in the water, not that much water, okay? But she was determined, and she accomplished her goal. So she was in there. I was way over. They wouldn't even let me come down to where she was. You know, they had it kind of roped off. So I was, I, if, if I had to jump in the water and get her, Praise the Lord. Jesus be an inner tube. <laughs> Jesus be a floaty. <laughs> but I would have tried. But my fear and my anxiety, I couldn't bleed that off on her. I even said, Kinsley, you know, right here we got some pictures. We can just look at the dolphins. No, Gigi, I want to swim with the dolphins. Sometimes we allow other people's fear anxiety, all that stuff they bring to you, Sister Roe, because you're a great listener, and they bring all their stuff, and they dump it on you. We can't allow others' fear and anxiety to halt us from our focus, and so David had to get away from the people that were causing him to feel the same way they were. He was. Fear and anxiety can distract us. David had to keep the main thing the main thing. He had to come back and go, wait a minute. He delivered. He made provision all this time. So why am I so upset now? So in verse 5, David had to go away and encourage himself because he couldn't depend on the folks that was around him to do it. That helped him to regain his focus. So when we worry, we have fear, we have anxiety, even if it's not our own, we have to be intentional about, wait a minute, if, if you come to me and you need your bills paid every time, but you're not being intentional or, uh, for, you know, with your money, why am I losing sleep about your lights getting cut off? If you're not even trying, why... Should that be my problem? Somebody said, it is not, I should not have to put, set myself on fire to keep you warm. But we take that on, don't we? Our, and listen, our kids, woo, that's a whole nother, okay. Um, detour, detour. All right. <laughs> the situation or circumstance that we find ourselves in, we have to quell the noise. We have to get away from everything. We got to even the noise that's coming from ourselves. We got to tell ourselves to shut up sometimes. If what I'm saying to myself is not lining up with the word of God, then I need to say self. Self says, hmm, shut up. Because you're not aligned with the word of God. And see, we can tell other folks, you know, I don't receive that. Okay, but you, you receive it from yourself. I'm just saying. We have to quell that noise. God takes care of our needs. Bree just read the scripture this morning. We don't need to worry about all that stuff. Y'all, that is so freeing. 
when you just say, okay, God, what's up? He wants us to come to him. Amen. He wants us to bring, he says, cast your cares, throw your cares on him because he cares for you. All right. So number three, fear and anxiety. We got to be intentional about it. And the last one here is uh, no vision. In order to focus, when I go get my bifocals, they make me take them off. Yes, I, I, I bit the bullet, right? And they tell me to focus. My, sometimes my focus is off. And so sometimes my focus has to be corrected with my focus. In order for me to see clearly, I have to have my vision corrected. As some of y'all in here got to have y'all vision corrected too. Amen. <laughs> but I had to make a decision. I kept trying to get them single visions, and then I'd be holding the book way out there like my grandma used to do. And I said, nope, we're not doing that, okay? <laughs> not doing that. Y'all to give me them no lines, them no lines, all right? <laughs> so David said, I got to get my vision corrected because I be, it's been convoluted with all of this stuff, all this stuff that's going on in the world. Sometimes our vision can get, uh, it can get blurred and, you know, and distorted. And so sometimes God has to have us correct our vision. And so David had to make a decision. Say, make a decision to get the vision. I have to decide to leave them folks where they are and go get in front of God. He said, hey, priest, bring me the, the ephod because I need to go talk to, he go talk to God. Amen. He called the priest. And then he said, okay, God, what, what do I need to do? I told my little niece because she had said something about we are told not to question God. You know, her brother that was killed, she was like, and I'm struggling. And I said, the word will free you up because David inquired. Is that a question? Inquiry? Question? Mm. So he inquired of the Lord. And then God even said, if, any, if you have lack of understanding, ask me. He going to tell you. I heard somebody else say this uh, this morning on the way to, to, to church, well, God ain't going to answer everything. Yes, he do. He answers. He answers. <laughs> it may not be the answer you want, but he answers every time. If you can get in a place to where you can hear him. So he called the priest and he asked questions. He said in verse 8, do I need to go after these jokers? And God said, yeah, go after them. He said, am I going to overtake them? Am I going to get my stuff back? You're going to recover everything, everything. He said, yes, pursue, and you will recover all. See, some of us, the pursuit, we don't want to pursue because pursuit is work. All right? So those 600 men that was with him, now because he's such a leader and he had gotten a strategic plan from God, he goes back to the people. He said, look, God said we're going to get our stuff. Let's go. Let's ride out, right? And, and 600 went with them. They was, but it said, oh, 200 was still too weary. So what David did, he said, y'all stay here. And when David, if you read on in the story, he didn't just get his and the 400 folks stuff. He got everybody's stuff. See, some people are tied to your vision and your purpose, and because you're stagnated and you're not focused, they not going to get what they need because of you. That's tight, ain't it? Because, see, we, we live in a world where it's me, myself, and I. Me, my foe, and no more. And God said, no, 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 no. I've called you to more than that. You have millions in your belly that God has uh, assigned to you and your purpose. And you sitting back here going, I don't think I can do it. I don't know. I'm not smart enough. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not this enough. I'm not this. And God is saying, go and pursue. So now that he has a plan, when you get a plan from God, when you get that word from God, it can get your focus back on track. Hallelujah. Somebody say glory to God. Glory to God. It can be hard because we live in this world, but we're not of this world. So that means that we don't operate in the same system that the world operates in. Pastor Trayvon again said, be not conformed. Don't be conformed to the the ways of this world, but be ye transformed. Y'all remember Transformers? Transformers, 
more than meets the eye, right? And so the thing would start out one way, and when it become transformed, you couldn't even tell that that used to be a tractor <laughs> because it, it was totally transformed. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to totally transform us so that the people who knew us way, 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 way back then don't even recognize us. They, don't, they, they see the face. We look the same. We done put on a few more pounds or whatever in my case. But they don't know me because I've been transformed by the renewing of my mind. And so God says, David, go get your stuff. In order to get a plan, you got to get away from negative folks. you got to get a vision. Where there is no vision, the people will die. Amen. In order to stay focused, we need a strategy and we need to ask God. Amen? Amen. Being undecided, unstable, wishy-washy, hallelujah. You're like out on the rough seas. When we were on the boat, Kenzie and our room was on the very front of the ship, and we hit like some little weather, and that boat was leaking and going. Amen? That's how we are when we don't make a decision to be intentional about our focus. When we're half-hearted, we're unstable. Can we really expect for God to do anything for us when we're in that condition? Vision is the thing that makes us keep moving forward. When we don't believe that God will help us accomplish our purpose, we end up just half-heartedly going through and not really realizing the purpose that God has for us. In closing, we can take the example of Jesus. Jesus didn't let anything distract him from his mission. Hallelujah. He wholeheartedly believed that he was meant for something greater, so he kept his focus, and we see that everything that he did pointed him to his mission. He was relentless, even when he was betrayed by a friend, denied by a disciple tricked by the church folks, and even forsaken by his father as he carried our sins on the cross. He was still relentless. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't even know what they're doing. And I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. He never wavered. He never shrunk back from his purpose. Hallelujah. Even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying, and he said, Lord, let this cup pass from me. Because the human side of him had woken up, and he was like, this is heavy. Y'all heard Pastor Patrick last week? He said, but nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. When you get authentic, when you get real, when you get intentional, God will give you a strategy for every area of your life. And that's what I like about God. It ain't just church stuff. He wants us to win. Because we his kids. You want your kids to do good, don't you? When your kids leave the house, you say, remember your last name? Don't play. God is saying the same thing. When we're out here and we're going through trials, tribulations, circumstances, situations, health issues, money issues, kid issues, spouse, friend, all of that. God still says, I need you to show forth my power so that somebody who's watching, I say, why she ain't crazy yet? I, I done seen what she been through. Why she ain't thrown in the towel? Why is he still pressing forward and you can lift your hands and say it's the power of God that causes me to keep my focus keep the main thing the main thing don't sweat the small stuff and with God it's all small stuff <laughs> it's big to us but God said oh that's, that's what you need you need a hundred thousand dollars oh okay I got about two, two people that's going to give it to you. They waiting to give it to you. 
But you got to maintain your focus and don't get, don't start looking at your bank app. Woo, Jesus. But look at his. The cattle on a thousand hills are his. And he's a good, good father. And when your heart is right, that's it. See, people, we have, a, we have to deal with this ugly heart. Jeremiah said, ain't no good thing. Nothing is good in here. So God said, I will take that heart of stone, and I will give you a heart of flesh. But if your intention, see, we can't see your intentions on the outside. But God says, you know, when people say, God know my heart, I'll be like, yep, he sure do. <laughs> God know my heart. So is that why I'm stagnant? So I got to go back and do the work. I got to get real and say, God, you know what? I, I really want it, you know, that for me. And God said, that's not my purpose for you. So that's why you ain't got it. Because your intention is to use it in a way that doesn't glorify me, but edifies you. So whatever we need today from God, God, I need, to, I need you to show me. David said, search my heart. He said, turn the searchlight on my heart. And all that ugliness that we tried to cover up, we tried to put some little Mac and uh, Fashion Fair, I don't even know if they make that anymore, <laughs> on it. We tried to cover it up. We tried to put on a nice suit, you know, put on my fitted, you know, put on my, my kicks and look good to the people. God said, it's some, it's some, it's some, some nastiness that you got to deal with necessary nastiness for you to be able to see your purpose and see your vision and be able to go forth and change the nations. Twelve disciples turned the world upside down. Turned the church folks on their head. And that's what God is calling for us to do. We're overcomers. So we should be overcoming every area of our life. God bless you. God bless you. I don't know who's getting in next. Pastor, somebody. Uh, I'm ready.